Hey, try and eat the shredded cheese in your fridge at 3 a.m. without waking your dog? Try this on for size. We're looking at Thief, the relic of a dead age reanimated on Steam more or less thanks to the community. It's a series torn by the very advancement the games forewarn of, a great unraveling of flesh, an installation of cold synthetics, a lot less bonk, a lot more But the games never strayed from their main goal, right? It was always about stealing things, making bank, not being able to see, trying not to be loud. Ah, oh, damn it! I mean, it says what it is. Right there. It's part of that illustrious, immersive sim lineage. Okay. Let's cut the crap. Thief went from diamond in the rough to shiny boil in as much time as it took for one company to jack the rights. Here's the grave. Let's start digging. Thief 1, the progenitor, the classic, the get-in, get-out, sticky finger spectacular. It plays all right. There's only one problem. It's old. But hey, let the geriatrics speak for themselves. It's a simple game. You're a guy. You sneak around, take some things. It's fun. Usually you're dropped into a pretty big zone with a single ultimate objective and no real clue how to get there. Okay, Overlord's fancy and you go up, you go, uh, go, and you go, and you go. What? It makes the player put their big gamer pants on and figure everything out on their own, a far cry from the mini-maps and objective markers of today. Of course, the modern gamer's sputtering. I have to read. It's what players loved about Thief. If you beat Thief, that was yours, and no one could take it from you. And the game was easy to love. It's got that old PC charm that's rough. Sure, acknowledged. That guy's face is a JPEG, but it's all functional. The world was full of wild and wacky characters. You must kiss the ground underneath my toes. There was quality world building, at least for a game of the era. The game is constantly winking at the player with humor and notes, in NPC dialogue. It's a lot more alive than it looks. The crown Jewel being the protagonist. Gamer's got a decent one-liner factory in Garrett, but his real success is the voice work. Running messages and picking pockets to keep my ribs from meeting my spine. Spends a lot of time spitting up gravel, I guess. Dressing aside, the game's great for 98. Oh wow. That's some stiff competition. And 98 was a pretty varied year for stealth, a young and vulnerable genre. There's enough videos on Thief's wild development cycle, but suffice it to say that Thief 1 is a proof of concept. The gameplay is fine, the stealth works, players use the light gem at the bottom to tell how visible they are, and sticking to shadows is pretty mandatory. But Garrett's wearing tap shoes and his footsteps phew, echo on anything that isn't carpet or grass. Enemies react quickly to stimuli and they will f you up. Two charging guards is basically a death sentence. I won't lie, sometimes the enemies feel a little too perceptive, like if they figure out in one spot they'll home in on you no matter how much you move, like a clinking torpedo. I know a lot of people want to rib me for enjoying my Dishonored playthroughs without stealth and probably think I can't stomach it, but not so. In Dishonored, the game is designed for player creativity and freedom, and that freedom is sweet. Thief is often open-ended, but what you can actually do in the environment is pretty restricted. Worming your way through the level can get agonizing on a blind playthrough, but you can save anywhere. Getting caught might be a game over a lot of the time, but the result is no big deal. You reload in a second and get going. Most of my complaints can be summed up with, had to find a switch, how was I supposed to find this? And there's still a fair bit of flexibility. You don't have to kill anyone. I'm pretty sure you don't have to touch anyone. Still, gamers love touching. Gamers are compulsive, and the pull to deal with everything that moves is strong, especially because you're not outrunning guards. Even civilians are a threat. Sometimes, violence is necessary. This curtains for you, you dumb AI. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of weird, abusable stuff, like being able to retain momentum just after jumping, so you can jump consecutively to fly across the the screen and potentially kill yourself? Leap on, you slinking goon. Garrett gets a lot of help from the scores of items available to the player. Water arrows to douse torchlight, moss arrows to pad footsteps, fire arrows to... Just a lot of pointy sticks. I think the rope arrow is the real winner, letting you interact with the environment in ways clearly intended, but not often required. The trouble is, items are expensive, and you can blow through a full treasure hall for healthcare. Oh sh**, this really is immersive. The sound design is integral to these games, so I played at night with headphones on most of the time. It's surprising how much power the game has over the player, restricting action with mere footsteps. Unknown sounds will put you on edge. At one point, I heard this gross chittering, turned the corner into one of those 
those cray men and just ran away out of sheer terror. Well, that and because the sound is insufferable. Actually, a lot of enemies are painful to listen to. Zombies aren't scary because they're dead people. It's because two of them will demolish your eardrums. <laughs> now, Thief is good. I should mention I'm playing the Gold Edition, which adds more levels, and there's an argument that just playing the original is more valuable because the pacing is clean. There's no bloat. I don't know. There's a command to skip a level if you need to, and gold only carries between the end of the level to the shopping screen. Figure it out yourself. What's bizarre to me is expectation versus reality. I expected, knowing nothing, a dark fantasy stealth game. What's actually going on is a low-key steampunk semi-Victorian stealth game with a weird faith slash humanist slash urbanity versus nature thing going on. The religious Hammerites versus the naturalistic pagans, and the story, though minimal, gets interesting pretty quick, and it's reflected in gameplay. You're not stealing from barons and dukes for long. Eventually it turns into giant lizard things, zombies, ghosts. What is that? The setting is all over the place, even though it's set in the, uh, <clears throat> the city. Ancient tombs with Indiana Jones traps. <laughs> Underground lava cities. I don't know, some psychopath's idiot mansion. It turns into a pulp adventure before long, presumably because stealth was a somewhat unproven game concept and the devs wanted the game to be varied enough that a wider audience would see the appeal. At least it really sells what it needs to, even if it loses environmental focus. The game's tough, a lot for a player to handle, but there's a surprising power fantasy in environmental mastery, in voyeurism. Ugh, now it's weird. So the game got a follow-up in Thief 2 The Metal Age. You might have heard, it's pretty good. Good. The sequel's ideal in almost every way. The core's in place and the coating's polished to a shine. Thief 2 is the fully realized version of what Thief 1 was lauded for, but not without a price paid in time. The game's almost mechanically identical, tightened in a few places, no more flying thieves. Otherwise, it really is more of everything. There's a whole host of new items to terrorize NPCs with, some new contraptions on theme with the rise of the metal age, like a scouting orb and a glow stick. Even frog bombs. Go frog bombs! We ride! You know, I love games like this for the unexpected ways that create beauty on limited hardware. God bless. The levels are bigger. A lot bigger. And the objectives are more complex in general. Not that the first game didn't have its complexities. There's a lot more verticality in stage construction. <laughs> Every stage feels like a flushed out environment, and I don't remember many or any being throwaways or bucking typical mission structure like the last game. The thing's more cohesive, and they got the chance to do that because Thief 1 did so well. Stealth was officially a proven concept, and a lot of levels reflect that solidified identity. And it still finds time for humor. <laughs> Real requires some unnecessary ventilation! Though admittedly, some of the stuff you find is eye-rolling at best. Can you imagine if this shit... Are you serious? It's awesome that we got a fully rendered part of the city to walk through. Though the actual mission reminds me of something. Ladies, gentlemen, dems. We're witnessing the birth of the Assassin's Creed tailing mission. Deliver us from sin! The narrative also exudes a more considered, artistically unified approach, with the pagans all but defeated and the mechanists, heralds of the Metal Age, pushing humanocentric progress on the rise. The player teams up with the... <laughs> people to halt the advancement of the human species. I guess. It helps that the bad guy is voiced by Droopy F*** Dog. Soon all will be blessed with the breath of the builder. I constantly felt like Dishonored copped a bunch from this game. Just looking at the theming of the mechanists, the general adjacency the two franchises have, the ways player choice is allowed to blossom, at least on normal mode. You have so much freedom to do whatever with whatever. Ooh. A-plus analysis, bro. The introduction of mechanical turrets, alarm systems, and patrol robots is perfectly on theme and easily more terrifying than any zombie. First off, a turret on the other end of a dark room going <laughs> is a jump scare. Every time. The bots are scary and hard to manage, hard to kill. It's the same challenge that the supernatural enemies presented, but more appropriately flavored. I'm a big fan of assuming that water arrows would work on their circuitry and shutting them down. That's some intuitive shit. They're not perfect, of course. The giant ones get caught indoors, and since they launch bombs at you with their one arm, they'll just destroy themselves. Yeah, welcome to this stupid club population all. I try to play games on their normal difficulties, try to look at the game at the consumer level. I mean, I'm no genre master. 
master. I cover a lot of stuff, but there's consequences to that method. Normal in two is the easiest difficulty, which I think makes it a lot more playable on a first pass, but robs the game of additional guards and objectives, among other things. One thing that doesn't change in Thief 1 or 2 between difficulties, however, is combat mechanics. Guards take the same damage between difficulties and have the same health, but unlike Thief 1, where combat was painful, I found myself abusing it a lot more often than I should have, often giving up entirely on playing in full stealth because I could stunlock regular guards with overhead swings. Because with a little tool application, you can run circles around these guys. I mean, watch this raw gameplay where I get caught and blindly stupidly batter my way to victory. It's bizarre. The player is given more health and presumably more power overall, so the devs chose to curb that kind of behavior in higher difficulties where killing too many enemies will fail the mission. So there's an issue. You have to play a specific way on higher difficulties to get the full bodied experience, and I bet a lot of people like that, but it's a big time and repetition investment when you're learning. And how am I supposed to have fun without frogs at my side? Go frog bomb! We ride! In any case, these games are rough playthroughs, but they're exciting in a way many games aren't. They're what I'd call active challenges, as opposed to something more passive like Metroid Prime, for example, because you always have to be on. There's a certain level of performance you need to exhibit. Your senses are always working to calculate where noises are coming from, how much noise you make, if you have time to knock someone out and pull the body away, if you think you can handle fighting the guards. And though there are safe locations in the games, there certainly aren't many on the way to objectives. You're gonna have to strap on the snowshoes and get plotting. It demands your attention, but it only takes a mission to burn you out, and you'll probably want a break to remember to water your eyeballs. I guess my biggest complaint about Thief 2 is, I mean, the studio zone complaint. The game was rushed. It disappointed with its repurposed levels. Sometimes back-to-back -back repurposed levels. It's unfortunate. Alas. Like Thief 1, 2 is a demanding experience, but extremely rewarding if you're willing to break in. And you think this stuff's ugly? Not worth anyone's time? Check the community out. I'm not sure how big the classic Thief community is these days, but uh, considering it takes fan patches to get the games running flawlessly, considering the mountains of fan content and gameplay tweaks and the level editor for the game, I think it's pretty safe to say this thing meant the world to a lot of people at some point in their lives. Was a bastion of creativity and expression, and that's beautiful, even if the faces aren't. No offense. Now normally you'd have to listen to a tedious pedant read a Wikipedia article on the development history of Thief and how it informed the creation of the third game, Deadly Shadows. So the gist is, Looking Glass Studios finished Thief 2 despite stinking like shit, then realized a bunch of other games flopped and the Thief 2 money wasn't coming fast enough. Then Eidos snatched the rights as they drifted down the wind and had the Deus Ex people develop Deadly Shadows, and it scored well. But that's about it. Deadly Shadows is a surprising game, something I wish more people were into because I see almost nothing but good. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think the only people blasting this one were older fans disappointed with the direction it took. It's just shocking. Most of 2004's heavy hitters came out in its final quarter, you know? And this was out in May. Uh, so is Deadly Shadows a thief game, having lost its original studio? Aside from many original employees joining Ion Storm, absolutely. And more than that, it brought Thief into the modern era. It radiates a comfy, early 2000s console energy, like Fable. It features the same basic gameplay and a new engine, with major gameplay additions like the semi-free roam city streets. It's mostly just a buffer between missions, but it's a neat place to commit, you know, general thuggery. Oh god, you found- Oh god, you found- So what does it retain from its predecessors? Mission structure for one, where the levels are pretty open-ended, or at least interconnected in interesting ways, though admittedly the levels feel smaller and at times more linear, giving a sort of puzzle box impression. I'd argue it makes the levels more digestible overall. Missions still have a singular goal, or a constantly changing goal as the level unfolds. It's worth noting that one of the major things the game did poorly was loading screens, especially within levels, but most of these can be removed with patching, which you gotta do to get it running anyhow. Items are back, naturally. It's mostly familiar faces, combat enhancers, you Utility, though money is extremely easy to stockpile, and getting absurdly kitted out only takes a few missions. I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily, I'm just saying, for the first time in any of these games, I had a full stack of gas bombs and fire arrows on top of health potions, where before, even buying two fire arrows was an investment. So the player's given all these ways to deal with enemies. It shouldn't be a problem for series veterans. Lots of purists think you should do ghost playthroughs and never be detected, and the game will let you do that just fine. But the struggling player has so many more options on that note, rest in power, Rope Arrow, and uh, go f*** <laughs> yourself, climbing dumbs! Lastly, combat's decentivized much more strongly than 2. 
and maybe even one. No long sword for Garrett. No, you get this little baby knife, which will kill people, no doubt, but you gotta get real close, and attack animations are extremely quick, making it difficult to weave in and out of armed conflict unscathed, at least if you're trying to kill someone. Most of the time, you're better off running, which works way better than before, thanks to reliable flash bombs. Shoot, just running in circles will tire guards out. That never would have happened in the early games. You'd be chased all through the castle without some tricky maneuvering. Overall, the player is much more in control of enemies than previous games. Real quick sidebar, I mean to say that melee combat bad, because you can kite and kill anybody with arrows. Holy shit. Deadly Shadows pushes the boundaries of the series fairly often, the most obvious change being perspective. Players can swap between first and third person views with a button, and while I love the option and use it almost all of the time, the mode serves to feed the player more information than they'd have access to normally. Part of what makes the original game so tense is never really knowing where guards are, and being able to swing the camera for a full view of any room betrays so much information to the player. Still, it's an aesthetic thing. The game looks really good. Like Light streams shimmering and cutting the endless blanket of shadow. It's hard to see, which is why I love the third person view so much. Seriously, you don't want to know how much unusable footage I took from these games, and this one in particular. The game sets the mood in more advanced ways, the trifecta of lighting, fully realized 3D graphics, and a soundtrack that rises above ambient drones. Did I just feel something? in a thief game? The streets and general game flow changes were pretty fairly criticized. Yes, it's cool, but walking halfway across the city every time I want to advance the plot isn't particularly enjoyable. And it's not like the streets are safe. At least guards lose to wooden boxes, idiots. Regardless, it's weird that they chose to loosen the flow of the game for the sake of creating a more obviously living world. But it doesn't tank the experience at all, it just favors the explorer, Johnny Funhaver. What's straight up annoying is having to find a fence to sell your stolen crap to than hunting down a vendor with the stuff you want. With a bigger world comes bigger narrative possibilities. It's really cool seeing the city in 3D, seeing it open up with the plot's progression. The enclaves different factions occupy, Hammerites from the first game return alongside their opponents, the Pagans. I'm glad they returned. They seemed so archetypal, but so appealing in their unabashed weirdness. From religious recitation to Pagan gibberish. When I find as you, your blood be used to feed many. You can actually gain the trust of these factions, apparently by shooting beetles for the Hammerites. Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, it makes no sense. Both of these people want Garrett dead, but hey, they won't attack you. They'll even greet you in the streets. It's kinda nice. The story's more complex this time, with a full hero's journey, believe it or not. It's the first time you actually see the majority of the characters. There's a greater sense of weight to everything, and while it may be a thief game, and therefore silly at times, the story's pretty appealing, with Garrett actually experiencing character development, coming into his own, somehow topping the previous games. Although, relying on their old trope, which totally happens in the first two games, of character talking into them walking two feet off screen into... Garrett? or character name, really overstays its welcome. Artemis? Where do you think you will find this proof? Garrett? Regardless of the changes, how do the mechanics stack up? Well, jumping and climbing mechanics, even ladder scaling is basic. I'm nitpicking, but grabbing a ledge feels like a gamble, almost as bad as the last game could be. Seriously. Still, I'm glad it wasn't a canned animation, but it comes at the cost of consistency. It makes the game seem unpolished. The game also kind of struggles with doorways, mostly in the player's favor this time, for maximum thuggery. How'd I go this long without talking chests? Lockpicking's a step up from previous games, though it's one of those elements I felt disappointed by from the start. In the old games, you get two picks and and literally hold them on a lock to open it, often switching back and forth. It takes a long time. It's not engaging. It ain't fun. So Deadly Shadows has this complicated looking ring, but really, you find the weak point and then hold your mouse or stick there, and then find the next ad nauseum. It's usually just short of the direct opposite of the last one, so you can almost mind read locks by the end game. The real problem's the blackjack. Yeah, it's not the worst thing ever, but in the old games it worked. You want that guy down? Boom. In Deadly Shadows, you're gonna need to position yourself 85 degrees to the victim's backside, look directly at Jupiter on the fifth day of the week on an odd month, recite a Gregorian chant under your breath, and pray the thing connects. Garrett will adjust his arm if he's gonna score a knockout. It's not that big a deal, but it takes a bit to get down. Some of the Latin's hard to pronounce, and swapping to first person makes it strangely easier. Oh yeah, and I didn't want to bring it up, but uh, just between you and me, games fucked. Glitches exist in a lot of games. Sometimes games we like. I'm just saying. It wasn't the climbing failure glitch that got me, no big deal. That's the closest we'll ever get to Garrett T-posing. No, it was climbing through the wall 
to my death. Okay. Okay. God, I guess that's the root of it. I don't love this game because it's the best thief installment, but because it's extremely playable, full of all that wacky gamey stuff that makes it human. Bonking dudes in 3D, making enemies slip on the grease. Explosions. 3D animated murder! By the end of the game, the streets erupt in chaos with the two factions, the guards, a group of assassins, and a giant freak killing each other openly. It's awesome! Thankfully, the AI is too stupid for boxes. Yeah. And the game got a lot of praise for what it did, specifically over one level that's apparently one of the scariest levels in video games. Actually, it's the asylum of twitchy corporeal ghosts with a time travel mechanic. I don't know, I don't want to undersell the scenario. This place getting praise means the game was at least recognized for its environment design, which is good. What floors me is meeting a ghost girl who tells you that you're trapped inside and you're gonna have to kill yourself to leave. Sorry, come again? Yeah, just uh, lob yourself at the window. Don't even worry about it. Okay. Wow! Fourth. You know when you're scrolling on Twitter, social media, whatever, and there's some comparison meme? X is just Y. X looks like Y. You know, real high-level thoughts like that. One I like is Thorf's like Dishonored. Oh! Is that so? But it's easy to see why someone with two brain cells might say that. They look kind of similar after all. A dark industrial Victorian era city with vertical stage design, mature themes, weird supernatural elements. But Dishonored doesn't suck and is infinitely more complex and freeform in its construction. Thorf says perish the thought. In fact, Thorf hates a lot of things. Basically all the old game's aesthetic and world building elements. The secret society of keepers, banished. The zealous hammerites, Sponged, the pagans, mechanists, anything not perfectly cropped to fit the setting, a f***ing annihilated. And I get the temptation. It's pretty clear that the conceptual work done for this game was vast, like a broad reimagining of the series to make it consumable to the modern console market. And hey, it's not DMC, okay? Text isn't popping up on the walls saying, f*** yes. you, Garrett, but it's still a bridge too far. The fans aren't here to gargle your post-abortion fluid, okay? They want representation. You could have worked in everything and reflavored it, toned it down to fit the setting. But oh no, we get Garrett's eye, which remains but is more or less ignored. We get the return of Basso, everybody's favorite character, reimagined as a weird middleman to get work from. I think that might be it. Thanks for throwing fans a bone, or in this case, two nostalgia tic tacs. But the new elements come from only the finest creatives sleep deprived ghoul Garrett, Granny Rags, Primal, just. Primal, a cheap rebranding of glyph magic, a couple of awfully unexplored factions, and a plague. Embarrassingly called the Gloom. Oh no, not the Gloom. The Gloom's coming! <coughs> but with the cleaner aesthetic elements, the story's bound to be more functional. So we get this mysterious girl who really likes Garrett, but also happens to be supremely unlikable, you know, for straight murdering an innocent, unprovoked, and just being awful in general. So Garrett steals her weapon and she's like, Garrett, I'm going to die without my weapon! And she's gone. Garrett. That's the best thing you've ever done! Now she'll haunt you for the rest of the game. It's actually a decent setup. I was invested for about 30 minutes. And that's basically the intro level. But it all kind of loses focus in time. Mostly with the mediocre Netflix writing. Everything thus mentioned is surface level. But the game betrays the vision of the previous entries and arguably good design in general. Fundamentally. Thief 1 and 2, even Deadly Shadows, all presented semi-realistic building layouts with offices, latrines, guards, kitchens, living quarters, every Everything accounted for. It was integral to the games, and with few exceptions. I mean, even the levels where you weren't expressly thieving from private estates or public infrastructure, they were still complex and looped around. Alternate paths, options, you could use rope arrows to create new routes. Thorf settles on a linear assortment of rooms divided by hallways. Single hallways, right? It's not gonna have you crawl through a mansion going whatever way you like for the most part. I mean, you can make micro decisions, you can go left or right, but that's the kind of variable gameplay present in Bioshock Infinite, and not really befitting of the name Thief. There actually are a couple of atypical paths you can take, but you need to buy a certain tool. Imagine my disappointment starting the second level, finding an alternate route, but being denied because I didn't pick something up from the store. Even in Dishonored, you can hunt for runes in the current stage and upgrade the appropriate skill if you find a path you really want to take. 
Come on, game, this stuff's solved. Presumably, the stages are divided as they are for two reasons. One, story integration is more direct, meaning lots more cutscenes, and they're there. I don't know why cutscenes make the game better or present a better direction overall, but they exist. The other reason is hiding loading screens, which they do a lot, but I'll take a loading screen over a painfully slow hook ride between stealth arenas, frankly. It's so sad that aesthetic decisions and hardware limitations is a direct result of what consoles can handle, effectively shatters the game's kneecaps. And last I checked, Deadly Shadows was getting dragged for its open world, so the devs saw that and thought, okay, we can do it better. There's an open world connecting various stages. You can even revisit old missions to grind money if you're insane, or need the game easier than it is. The open world has little places you can rob, like Deadly Shadows, and side missions as well, but for the most part, you open the map, find the shop, and move on. I don't begrudge the inclusion, I just don't think it's necessary, especially if they're doubling down on the linear design. Instead, they went with a mediocre approach to everything. And even if the game were built identical to the old games, level layouts, shopping screen, no minimap, objective markers, anything, the actual gameplay is enough to make me never pick it up again. Immersion's the name of the game. Strong narrative elements, cutscenes, characters, world building, etc. So obviously, Garrett's stupid hands need to grab up 20% of the screen or you won't be immersed. No big deal, right? But they put those hands to work. Every fork, every coin, every brush, Garrett handles every little little thing in the game with obnoxious control-wrenching canned animations and they look nice once. Shame you'll be doing this a thousand times. Let me tell you about the old game. See a cup? Beautiful. Not perfect, not directly immersive, but beautiful. Not in Thorf. The stuff you pick up isn't even intelligently distributed. Yeah, it makes sense that coins are worth one or two monies, and something bigger is worth more, but the actual animation to reward parody is completely skewed. Why bother going out of your way to pick up that glinting object if it's gonna waste your time for one-tenth of a food ration? There's enough gold just going straight anyway. It's sad. Oh my god, and the desks. Every desk has six drawers, right? So being compulsive, you're going through each and every one. It's it's torture. Half of them have nothing in them. At least you physically can't click a drawer you've already checked. You get exactly one point, Thorf. Don't spend it all in one place. And everything's an animation. Going in windows, taking a painting, snuffing candles. I'm so tired of his gross bony fingers dancing on my screen. Imagine those fingers touching you. <laughs> ah, but there's more to the gameplay than mere thievery. What about kill? In combat, you hit the dodge button, then you swing, then the enemy block, then you dodge, then you swing, repeat three four times, you somehow managed to make the sword play from one and two look complex. Good stuff. It's kind of tough if your timing's off and two guards can make it less than optimal, sure, fair enough. The mechanic they pushed into the game is focus, a resource that lets you cheat. With focus and the right abilities, you can crush an enemy's kidney in one hit. Or activate focus mode and see every interactable object if you're lost in this very straightforward game. So this is one of those, if I put a lot of time into the game, I can get absurdly overpowered mechanics, huh? Well, that's good. Collecting tons of money will let you upgrade your armor and damage too. I just... I was playing Thief just minutes ago. What happened? A final mechanical insult. Rope arrows return, but only work on the very specific points you're intended to use them on. So they found the rope arrow's grave, raised it from the dead, and puppeteered it through the streets like a puking jack and apes. Guys, have some respect for the dead. To top it all off, the sound design is not. This ain't the old game, okay? Sound doesn't matter. Stop listening to footsteps. It's not integral to the game. Guards don't patrol intrusively. You're basically in control with only your eyes. This is just depressing. There's an interview where they discuss how the sound is like the old games at length, and it really isn't. Not that it needs to be. The fundamentals are different. The game's so willing to cop what the devs thought the old games did well. You know, those outdated, ugly, immature games. So we get an asylum, just like Deadly Shadows. Oh look, Blinking paper. You already know there's a jump scare coming. Yeah, we knew. And you know there's one behind this door too. Okay. I think what really bothers me is the overall tone. Everything disrespects the old games, but surely people exist that like this one. Opinions are great. Here's an opinion. Taking away the lightheartedness, the humor, the fun, even the jankiness of the old games is an act of disservice to the franchise. The game's not slick, clean, and cool. It's dumb. It's so much dumber than it thinks it is. Aside from making characters as dreary as possible, it's stuff like making the player watch 
hammy BDSM and other stuff to find wall symbols to unlock a door. Look how edgy, how mature we are, the game says. Not everything's dreary or edgy, right? The main villain, apparently this guy, gets owned by Garrett basically all throughout the game. Then he flips a bed Garrett's under. Then Garrett ends up trapped by the bed he would that he was just under? D for dumb. And let's not forget, the city undergoes a kind of metamorphosis as background tensions among the lower classes rise and eventually the extremist revolutionary faction, the Graven, overturn the guards and become unironically just as bad. Thank you for your deeply ahistorical representation of revolution, protest, and class division. Please read any book. Never mind the half-baked Assassin's Creed-like climbing segments. Why? Why is everything cinematic, anti-player agency, linear levels, all these stupid animations, cutscenes, contextual arrows, jumping and entry, these enormous running segments that look great, sure, but aren't Thief. Do you have to look and play like every AAA game? Completely watered down? Killing your older, less savory parts for a cropped and shaven experience? You know, at some point the player gets lost in the shuffle and the game's playing itself, just happening. No thought, no plan. No fear, constant motion, wild abandon. The final boss makes you steal three shards, and the best way is just running full tilt into every one. When does it stop? It's all over. Just like that. It's actually kind of nice watching Thor fail. It was insulting. It wore the skin of a corpse and nothing more. It actively diminished the legacy of a quality series without offering a strong enough core experience to compete with the likes of DMC, which like, I'm sorry to make the joke again, features the ever tactful Ma'am, your demon fetus is goo! I have to assume older games in a series get played by developers or someone in charge at some point, right? And I know really cutting to the heart of what fans love can't always be a priority, but assuming the older games get played, do those people ever have fun with them? Try to have fun? A vision is one thing in game design, but a hijacking's another. Whatever, pouring one out for the Thief community. A dead reboot's a cold win. Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good, thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... Errol. Azero. Bazcart. Beverage Crisp. Boha. Brandon. Caesar T. Chief. Cody Golden. Corgi the Lad. Couch Moba. Crack Stuntman. C.W. Glassworks Kyle Lapreed David Castillo Den Het Don't worry about it Dylan Coffey Exa Frankenstitch Harkage Huey Jason Lasky Jaden J. Deus John Weber Joke Frog Justin Sherry Kelvin Latrix Laundry Mom Lego Sid Markules, Marmato, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Milky Moo Official, Mr. Dodongo, Miles Burris, Neatsy, Old Burgle, Only LK, Orn Magnus Palson, Pink Peacock, Quillworth, Reggie Rodriguez, Ricochet Frame, Salty Smasher, Sam Anga, Sekai Noah Warida, Seamus Nerd, Shod. Simp. God! Special Children. Super Sandwich Guy. Tenken Zephyrborn. Thrips Heartrop. Travis Edwards. Venom. Vic. Walter Taggart. Well, shit. Zachary Shields. Zachary V. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.